Thank you, Ian. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we own and drive, many of us own and drive cars that we do not really need. Um, on the other hand, many of us decide not to own a car, but sometimes we like to have access to one. So this is not really something that is sustainable for the long term. Our vision for the future is one where um, mobility is actually shared. Uh, it's based on like a shared vehicles, but this is something that is a concept that you can find realized today. There are several services that offer some form of vehicle sharing, car sharing, bicycle sharing, so on and so forth. Everybody likes them, nobody uses them. Uh, or very few people use this kind of services because they're still at the level of convenience or availability that is not what people want. I am convinced that in order to make this car sharing, this, this vision for car for shared mobility a reality, what we need is technology, and this, this is the technology of autonomous cars, where cars, you can, you know, whenever you need a car, you can call one with your smartphone, the car will come, picks you up, tells you whatever you need, you send it away, okay? Um, and this is, I, I think that actually here in Singapore, there is a very unique opportunity to make this uh, vision a reality. Um, this is what we are doing, and this is why we are focusing on Singapore, and you know, we'll tell you more of the story, but this is really where we see this happening uh, first. Um, some of you may have heard that actually yesterday uh, there was an event with LTA and the Ministry of Transport where we actually signed an agreement with LTA uh, that would support us in developing this, uh, this vision for driverless shared cars or driverless taxis, however, however you want to call them, you know, in the coming years. Okay? So, Okay, I will be talking about autonomous cars, test driving vehicles, you know, how one, uh, however you want to call them. And I think that there is a lot of confusion in the media and the general public about what self-driving cars are, what they can, you know, what they're useful for, what they can do, what they cannot do. When people talk about uh, self-driving vehicles, autonomous cars, uh, the first thing that people mention, the first thing that comes to mind is safety. Okay, people say that you know we all know that you know almost all traffic accidents are caused by human errors. You remove the human, hence you remove the errors. At least this is the principle, right? So then you remove all traffic accidents. Yeah, this is great. Other things that people mention is the convenience. Okay, so now you know you don't have to drive, so you can text or check your email legally while the car is driving itself. Okay, or you can sleep or you can watch a movie, you know, any other activity. Uh, that is a more productive or more pleasant than just driving. Third reason is increasing access to transportation. Uh, for example, people who will not be able to drive otherwise because, for example, they cannot see well, or maybe they are too young, or maybe they are too old, or maybe they had one drink too many, right, so they can actually drive home safely. Uh, other reasons include things like um, increasing throughput and efficiency of traffic, um, or maybe reducing the environmental impact. Okay. These are all fantastic things. However, if you think all of each one of these areas is, what well, each one of these benefits is actually taking the existing uh, transportation system and making it a little bit better, okay? I think that, you know, this is great, but that's not all there is to it. I think that, you know, what we are really interested in is to try to figure out how this kind of technology can actually change the way that the transportation system works, okay? It's common in the startup world to talk about disruption, right? We want to change the world. I think that's a, what I'm interested in is not make the world a, a, a place that is a little bit better, but it's a place that is very fundamentally different, of course, but in a better way. Now, I talk about, you know, five different potential benefits. Uh, how do you compare them? You know, how do you say which one is more important or uh, you know, better than, than the others? Right? So it's hard to compare. So what I will do is uh, take a little bit of a cynical stance and convert everything to dollars. Okay. Uh, the numbers are referring to the U.S. market. Okay. So what is the value of safety? What is the value of your life? 
Well, probably to you is priceless. Uh, to your loved ones and your friends and your family is priceless. To the government, at least in the US, it's worth about $9 million. Okay, so this is what they call the cost of a statistical life. So this is a number that the government, you know, when they have to uh, initiate uh, considering a, a new project, they say, okay, so if I do this, this will cost me, you know, this many million dollars, but this will allow me to save this many lives. And they compare the two, if it's worth it, then let's do it, so otherwise it's better to get people killed. You know, <laughs> right? So it's a little bit cynical, as I said, but you know, this is the kind of calculation that people make. Now, uh, in 2014, NHTSA, which is the uh, agency in the US that um, looks after the national uh, you know, highway safety, they released a report where they estimated that the economic cost of traffic accidents is about $300 billion a year. The so societal cost, you know, essentially the pain and suffering and all these things that make people's lives miserable, is, is being estimated to be about $600 billion. Okay, so the assuming that we, with autonomous cars or with whatever other technology we can reduce all the traffic accidents to zero, the benefit to society would be about $900 billion a year. One, almost one trillion, right? a lot of money. Let's look at other things. We can reduce congestion. The cost of congestion has been estimated to be about, uh, what is it, $100 billion a year. What is the cost of pollution? Another $50 billion a year. Okay. But now, what is, for example, the value of the time that you get back by not having to drive? So I did a very simple calculation, back of the envelope, I took the one half of the median wage in the US, which is an embarrassingly low number, okay? Uh, and multiplied by the number of hours that American drivers spend behind the wheel every year, the number that you get is about $1.2 trillion a year. Okay? So you see that already the value of the time that you get back by not having to drive is more than the value that you get from safety. Okay? There's a societal value. So this is not to say that autonomous cars should be unsafe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I think that you know, if you compare the benefits, the, the benefits is, is higher from the productivity or you know just the value of getting back your time. But if you look at this pie chart, we only we got half of it. Where is the other half going? Now, if a car can drive by itself, there is no point in keeping the car parked in the garage, right? Or you know, on the side of the street. If you think of it, most people throughout the world, most people who own a car, they invest a sizable chunk of their disposable income in Singapore, more than in other places, right? But then they use this car for roughly 5% of the time. The rest of the time, the car is parked, usually in some pretty expensive piece of real estate. So usually people, not only they pay for the car, but they also pay for the privilege of not using their car. Okay, again, this doesn't make a lot of sense. If the car can drive itself, so does it make sense to keep it parked? It makes better sense to just have the car drive and drive somebody else, okay? So then, if you start thinking in this, in this context of car sharing, then you look at all the benefits. Okay, so now I, you know, clearly I don't have to pay for parking. But not only that, I don't have to waste time looking for parking. I don't have to walk to and from the parking, uh, the parking space. Uh, if a fleet operator is actually buying the cars, you have a lot of economies of scale. Same thing for insurance, servicing, maintenance, everything else. So we if we estimate that the total um, you know, benefits to the uh, to the public is about 1.8 trillion dollars. Okay? And this is estimating what we call the sharing factor that is uh, of about four or five, that essentially one of the shared vehicles can replace five, four or five, um, uh, you know, parallel, parallel owned vehicles, okay? So what you see here is that it is a very sizable market, right? And most of the benefit is actually coming from the ability to share this vehicle in a very convenient, uh, in a very convenient way. 
Okay. Now, sorry. The next thing is to talk a little bit about what are these uh, autonomous vehicles, because I think, as I said before, there is a lot of confusion in the media and in the general public about what self-driving vehicles are and what they are not. There is this uh, classification of vehicle automation capabilities that is being proposed by Nissan. Um, okay, so no automation, level zero is no automation. That's your old fashioned, you know, like Ford Model T, you know, this is a car with just nothing automated, right? So uh, level one is something like a cruise control. You start combining one function. Uh, so cruise control is something that you can push the button and maintain the speed, but then you, you still have to drive and, you know, hit the brake, right? If you combine this function, two of these functions together, then you get what is called level two, okay? So level two is something that has cruise control and maybe automated steering. You're still required to be constantly engaged in driving and be ready to take over from the automation at any time. This is what the Tesla autopilot is, okay? Despite the name, this is what it is, okay? Level three is something where the car can actually take over without requiring you to drive all the time, but it will require you to take over control given sufficient warning. What is a sufficient warning? I don't know, right? <laughs> Level four is a, is a vehicle that is designed to be able to drive by itself without any human intervention at all times, okay? As you may see, I, I marked these three red because I think that these are two fundamentally bad ideas, okay? Because essentially, if you do any of these things, you are essentially designing your automation with the human as a safety critical piece of the, of the system, okay? And sorry, but even though I can design, I can do the best job I, you know, possible with the automation, I cannot design the human. And in particular, humans are known to not be able to work well with automation, for example, and is a little bit of a paradox because the better the automation gets, the less capable a human is at paying attention and being able to take over, okay? Um, it saddens me, I mean, you may, may have heard of the Tesla accident, uh, you know, that happened in May, and, you know, a person, you know, uh, unfortunately died as a result. I think that a lot of that is due to the fact that you know, people engage the autopilot and they think that, you know, and they start by, okay, so let me pay attention. And then the thing is working well, so their minds start drifting off, and then they start, you know, checking the email, and eventually they end up watching a DVD, right? Watching a movie. And that's how people die, okay? So this is a very, you know, from my point of view, this is a very fundamental problem, you know, just bad idea, and so we don't want to do that. For me, what we want to do is just make it clear, the car, <laughs> you need to drive the car or the car drives itself. There must not, cannot be any kind of uncertainty on who is in charge. Okay? Or in particular, there must not be any kind of like a forced handover that requires a human to just intervene, uh, you know, especially on short notice. Okay? So if, you, if you're thinking of where, how you want to realize the, um, uh, the value of self-driving cars, Okay, so if you really want, want to care about safety, then I think it's a really bad idea to have humans as a critical, on the critical path in your, in your system, okay? Now, even though many, so for example, Google has driven you know, their car for uh, about, what is it now, is uh, 1 million 700,000 miles or something like that. Uh, that looks like a big number. Uh, Tesla Autopilot has driven for 130 million miles. This may seem big numbers, but actually if you look at these numbers in the context of, you know, the rate of accidents, you know, for human drivers, and actually people have, you know, done some math correctly, and the Rand Corporation recently released a report where they estimated that in order to prove in a conclusive way that autonomous cars are safer than human drivers, you need to drive for about five billion miles. Good luck with that. Okay. <laughs> so. I think that the safety argument is an important argument. I think that it will eventually be true, but I think that this is something that will eventually be true on an asymptotic scale, okay? Some, at some point it will happen, 
but that's not something that I'm counting on today. Okay, so I think that you know benefits are really coming from other um, uh, from other benefits. The, as we discussed, the time value of driving. For that, you need level four, right? So, if the car is requiring you to pay attention, you have to sit there and pay attention. And at that point, I can just as well drive, right? So I cannot I cannot sleep. I cannot check my email. I cannot watch movies. I have to just pay attention to this thing. Well, from my point of view, I would rather drive. Okay. So uh, for this, you need level four. Car sharing. The the obstacle to car sharing is really two. You know the you know actually is really one is the availability. Okay, availability of a car when you need one, and then the availability of a parking spot when you want to get rid of the car. Okay. Now, if the car is able to drive itself and deliver itself to you or disappear when you don't need it anymore, that's all you need. Okay, so again, level four. You, you need the car to be able to drive by itself when nobody's inside. So, from my point of view, level four autonomy, or what people call this full autonomy, is essential to capture the benefits that we discussed. Okay, anything less is, from my point of view, is pretty much pointless. It's cool, it's a, it's a nice gadget. It's something that you can brag about with your friends and your girlfriend, you know, show off, but it's not that it's really changing um, the way that we think of mobility. Okay. So how do we get there? You know, people very often ask me, okay, so when is it that we will see autonomous cars as, you know, everywhere? And things like that. So um, let's look at this, uh, this picture where I'm showing here the different levels of automation that I showed before. Okay. Remember that I consider two and three as the danger zone. Okay, so we mark them in this kind of way. And then let's look at the scale and the scope of the deployment. Okay, so here is just a prototype or just driving around in a in a in a cross course. And this is something that where you actually have a mass deployment everywhere. Okay. From looking at the way that people are approaching this problem, you know, clearly what we want to do is get eventually, right? So we want to have complete autonomous cars driving around everywhere, right? The way, there are two paths that people are following. One is what I would call the OEM path, okay? So these are the companies that make millions of vehicles, okay? And of course, when they think of incremental steps, okay, so we cannot get, go from here to over there in one step, right? So you want to take little baby steps. But the car companies, Typically, I mean, this is my interpretation of their thought, okay? So this is not necessarily what they're thinking, but this is, this is what the way that we see them behaving. So they are used to producing millions of cars, right? So for them, baby steps are always measured in millions of cars. So is just develop a little bit of capability on millions of cars, do an automated parking, advanced cruise control, right? So these little bits, but deploy them you know, at scale on, on the whole, you know, f on the production of vehicles, okay? So you can think of that as, you know, just taking baby steps in terms of capabilities, but deploying them on all conventional production vehicles, okay? And if you want to do that, then you have to cross this danger zone, okay? This is where Tesla is today, and this is where people die, okay? So, uh, on the other hand, what I think is a, is a better path is another path that is actually followed by more the technology companies in a sense, right? So for example, Google, ourselves. So what we are thinking of is we go directly to full autonomy to level four. We don't do anything less. And for us, the baby steps are, let's start with one vehicle, <laughs> okay? Driving around in a parking lot, right? And then let's move away from the parking lot to a place like one north, right? So we're driving now. Then let's go to two vehicles, let's go to five vehicles, let's go to 10, to 20, so on and so forth. Let's try to expand the scope, okay? So this is the path that they follow, okay? I think that there is also benefit, but I think that, you know, on one hand, here you're not getting any benefits. So here you're only getting some publicity stunts, okay? You have to cross this, this danger zone, and I think that, you know, uh, it will not be, will be another 15 years or so before you will be able to go into a car dealership haggle over the price of the car and get out with the keys to a car such that you push the button and the car takes you home, okay? So we're looking at 2030 or so before you actually get any major benefits. 
With this other path, I think that we are much closer. Okay, so we are actually aiming at you know, some limited or some commercial deployment within a couple of years. Okay. So actually, this is uh, a video that shows uh, a little bit our vision. So what you will see in this video is something like it will be will not be completely novel to you because nowadays, you know, many people use Uber or Grab or Lyft or some taxi booking app such that when you need a car. You can just call, it, you know, book a car, and the car will eventually come and pick you up, right? And take you to, to, to your destination. But there are two main differences, okay? So the main difference is that, unlike Grab or Uber or any of these guys, when the car arrives, there is nobody inside, okay? What does this allow us to do? This allows us to, um, first of all, the main thing is that we actually can increase the availability of cars. Believe it or not, there are just not enough taxi drivers in the world in order to serve all the demand for mobility, okay? So one is increased availability, uh, and especially on Friday nights when it's raining, right? So this is my experience in Singapore, you know, good luck getting a car, you know, on Friday nights, when, especially when it's raining. Um, second point, we can per personalize uh, the ride and, you know, making the ride more comfortable, a, a better experience for the user. A third, we can also reduce the cost. Okay, so 40% of the cost structure of taxis and Uber and all these things is about essentially the the livelihood of the drivers. Okay. Um, the second benefit is by the time that you have, unlike taxis and you know systems like that, by the time that you get to your destination, our backend system has already computed where the car should go next go pick up the next customer, where that customer is, or go be recharged or serviced, or maybe just where to park in order to be able to uh, pick up the next customer in the minimum possible time. Right? Uh, actually, you know, there was a promotional video, so there was some amount of choreography involved. Uh, this is actually footage, you know, real footage from our vehicle. This actually was from a couple of months ago, this was uh, May. And you know this is the vehicle you know driving around at uh, one north, uh, and you know, there is no choreography here. You will see people crossing the street, and you know they don't know that they will be risking their lives. <laughs> <laughs> you know participating in this in this in this experiment. Uh, but you know the car is pretty safe. Uh, so you see that the car stops for pedestrians. Uh, you will see that the car is actually able to uh, uh, cope with kind of you know situations that may seem trivial to you as a person, but actually from the point of view of a robot trying to move around is actually quite challenging. For example, you will see here that as the car makes a left turn, there is a car parked in our lane, blocking our lane, and there is a car parked in the other lane, you know, kind of like almost opposite, right? So now we had to make the decision then, if in order to make any progress, we actually had to get into the other lane, which technically we shouldn't do, right? But people do it if, as long as there is nobody else coming in the other direction and it's safe to do so, and then go back to our lane. If there's a traffic light, it's red, there is an, another vehicle already there, so we queue up behind the other vehicle when the traffic light turns green that we eventually go for it. Okay? So, not surprising, the, what is surprising is that there is nobody driving. Okay? And so then, you know, the kind of studies that we have been doing is not only about the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the technology that makes a car able to drive itself, we're also trying to understand what the impact on the country, on society would be, right? Uh, this is actually a simulation that we did uh, based on uh, real uh, m uh, mobility demand data here in Singapore and on taxi data to get, you know, the travel times between any two points in Singapore at any given time of day. And what you will see, I mean, you will recognize, I don't have to explain you, <laughs> this is the shape of Singapore, the CBD area, right, and so on and so forth. What you see here is the time of day. Uh, whenever you see red, that's an empty car, okay, either stopped at a parking lot or a station waiting for a customer, or driving to pick up a customer. Whenever you see blue, is actually a passenger traveling. When you see the blue bubbles, is actually uh, passengers waiting for a vehicle, okay and the bigger the bubble, the, the bigger the queue for the vehicle, okay? So, okay, so this is the middle of the night, not in happening. You will see that around 5, 30, 6, um, people start waking up and going to work. Uh, you will see that there is these flows of vehicles that actually go from 
um, you know, from the uh, say from the CBD towards the residential areas to pick up people, right? And the, and bubbles, you know, queues forming up in the residential areas, and then all these people get rerouted and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, what do you get out of this? Um, is that we estimated that about a fleet of about 300,000 cars will actually serve the mobility needs of every single person in Singapore with waiting times at you know, rush hour of about 15, 20 minutes on average. Okay? Uh, how many is 300,000 vehicles? At the time when we did the study, there were about 800,000 ve passenger vehicles in Singapore. What this means is that you can take all of your cars, so, you know, 60% of them, you know, to some, you know, some other country, you know, get rid of all of those cars. Um, the big benefit of this clearly is, for example, you get, you know, typically in a city like Singapore, or pretty much any other city, for each car, there are at least three, four parking spots. So, if you get rid of half a million cars, you also get back two million parking spots that you can use it for, you know, people, residential, Units, parks, and you know whatever else. Okay? Especially in a place like Singapore, it is very important. Financial considerations. Actually, we did this analysis of what would this mean in the U.S. and in Singapore. Uh, actually, so this is the normal thing today. Okay, so just owning a car, I mean, people who own a car. Uh, actually, you will see that in Singapore, it doesn't make a lot of financial sense to own a car. You're actually you will be better off by taking taxis every time. Okay. In the U.S. is different, right? So taxes are much more expensive. But you see that in both cases, if you had autonomous vehicles that are actually shared, <coughs> you would reduce the cost of mobility by about one half. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about this, this story. So actually, we started um, you know, a project here in 2010. I, uh, in my free time, I'm also a professor at the MIT, which is the Institute of Technology. Um, Starting in 2010, we started this project um, in collaboration with the Singaporean government. It's the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. And we had this grant to work on future urban mobility, like a basic research. And we started working on this, and we started working on the technology. Uh, we were doing these little golf cars. In 2014, we did this public trial of golf cars in the uh, Chinese and Japanese garden in Jurong. Uh, I don't know if you heard about that. Um, we're working on cars, and you know this is the point where we are at now. So this is a video that I showed you before. Essentially, we started the company in so we started the smart project in 2010. Um, Kali and I, you know, co-founded this company in 2013. Uh, took us a while, you know, to get the things going, and finally we were able to attract uh, sufficient venture capital you know, about one year ago. And we went one year ago. We went from I think we had two full-time staff and a couple of interns. Now we have you know, more than 40 people. So uh, a little bit of the story, right? And I think that you know, we're really focusing here in Singapore because I think that there is the right combination of a societal need for more convenient, reliable, affordable, and sustainable transportation, coupled with a forward-thinking government that is actually willing to look at you know, new technologies to make the quality of life of their citizens better. And we're also very happy with the, you know, with the talent pool that is available here in Singapore. In fact, as you can imagine, since 2010, I've been traveling to Singapore a lot, spending a lot of time here in Singapore, to the point where my <coughs> wife started wondering if I had a second family. <laughs> <laughs> and, which, is, which is actually true. Uh, you know, I have all these you know, team of wonderful people working with me, uh, you know, since the day of smart, right? So even though we hired all of them into the company about one year ago when we actually got the venture capital necessary to support them, they've been working with me and, you know, with one another for about five years. Um, so the team was able to hit the, the you know, the, the ground running. Uh, so we have about, you know, 40 plus uh, at this point. We are probably looking to hire about at least 100 more people within the next year or two. Two thirds of the team are based here in Singapore. Right now we are based at Trade Hub 21, which is a place where there are a lot of furniture stores and us. <laughs> but I think that what we like is this, this showroom format for the office because we need to have the cars and then you know, the, the office where people actually work on 
know, coding the and working on the software. And so about half of the team has advanced uh, degrees from you know leading universities in the world and from the leading universities uh, here as well. Okay, um, and we're really leading the world in terms of you know like the robotics, autonomous vehicles. We wrote a lot of the state-of-the-art papers on robotics and autonomous vehicles, but not only that, but also on the uh, you know things like how would you manage a fleet of autonomous vehicles, what kind of impact will it have on society, and so forth. So it's very exciting. And let me conclude, you know, before I you know I pass the word to uh, to, to Mark. Let me conclude with a few comments on a quote that has been attributed to uh, Harry Ford. So apparently he said that if he had asked people what they wanted, people have, would have replied, we want a faster horse. Okay, so this is the early 1900s. Right? So this anecdote, it's not real, okay, so, but this anecdote um, you know, is usually taken to signify that the right answer, what people really wanted was not a faster horse, they wanted the Model T, right, the Ford Model T, uh, and which evolved in the car as we know it today. I claim that we still have a lot of work to do. That was not the right answer. What people really want is not a faster horse, is not a car. What they want is mobility. They want easy, convenient, affordable, sustainable access to mobility. And this is what we are trying to provide, first in Singapore, then in the world, starting in 2018. Okay? So let me conclude here, and you know, this is the overview of you know, what we are doing and why we are doing it. Uh, now I want to you know, pass the word to uh, teacher Karen Wompi Wompi Ronsen, <laughs> Thank like, you. also known as NOC. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, NOC has been, you know, there is, in somebody's career, you know, there are a number of events that happen that change everything. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have NOC joining me as a um, uh, she started working with me as a postdoc when we were at SMART uh, after you know, she did a PhD at uh, Caltech. Uh, she's been working with me at SMART for a number of years, then she had to go back to her own home country in Thailand, and we were actually able to get her back <laughs> uh, here. And you know, she's really um, my um, right-hand person uh, you know, in the company. She's really the person who's really like a superstar you know, researcher, engineer, uh, developer, and she's leading a lot of the work on the <coughs> planning control software for the company. Okay? Thank you so much for the <laughs>